I woke up one morning in Richmond at 6 a.m. to a phone call with terrible news. A dear friend who was traveling for business in Mali, Africa, he was staying in a hotel, and the hotel had been overtaken by terrorists with assault rifles who were walking the hallways, trying the rooms of guests and shooting unarmed people. My friend had been able to send an email because the internet had remained on, and he sent it to all his friends back in Richmond saying, pray for me. And I got up that morning, and I walked downstairs in the dark, it's before sunrise, and I remember laying face down on my living room floor, just pleading with God for my friend's life. All over Richmond at that same time, there were people down on their knees praying for our friend. I would later find out that at that time, he was down on his knees, leaning against a barricade that he had built against the door as he felt a terrorist try the knob. And I've a pause there because I carry this image of friendship in my mind ever since. This image that when, when friends are in trouble, we go down together. When your friend is on their knees, you go down on your knees. And I've thought about this ever since because usually we forget how high the stakes of life are but it's stories like this, it was moments like this that remind me that the stakes of life are so high, the stakes of friendship are high, and that's exactly what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. What I wanna tell you is that friendship, friendship with God and friendships with others will change everything about your life. If, if you have friendship with God and others, then you will thrive. If you miss friendship with God and others, then you will wither and some real part of you, if not all of you, will die. Why? Because Jesus says there is no greater love than this form of love. That kind of love that goes down and dies for a friend, that is willing to sacrifice and give for a friend. Apparently, Jesus says that is the greatest thing that you were made for. Do you believe it? Let me tell you about it. Before I, before I go into detail, I wanna introduce myself a little bit more. Um, the most important thing that I think you need to know about me is that in ninth grade, I was the kind of guy who tucked in my t-shirts. I also played the clarinet. I had Bible verses on the front of most of my binders. Red flags or beige flags, I, you tell me. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> So you, you can imagine how well high school was going for me. It was not going very well. Um, I had just moved from another city, so I was the new guy at my high school, and I was so anxious about everything. Everything was a major cause for worry and anxiety, over whether it was like what T-shirt to wear and tuck in, or whether it was to answer a question in class. Everything was hard, and I thought that was just life. I thought life was just like that. Until one day at a conversation at the lockers that changed the rest of my life. Here's what happened. A week before, I had gone on a youth retreat and I had met a friend named Steve, okay? And Steve and I that weekend bonded over things like, wait for it, skateboarding, drum sets, and hacky sacks. Very 1990s, okay? <laughs> Which I hear are coming back, so pay attention. I've been seeing some of the way you guys dress. The 90s are definitely coming back. <laughs> Um, my guy. <laughs> I had been watching these trends from the back of the social scene and realizing this is what some of the cooler kids were doing. So whether or not you know what a hacky sack is, you can Google it later if you want, it doesn't matter. What matters is this, Steve and I shared that weekend what C.S. Lewis calls the U2 moment of friendship. C.S. Lewis writes this, friendship arises when two companions discover that they have in common something, and they say, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. And suddenly, through semi-articulate fumblings, a friendship is born. All right, semi-articulate fumblings is the perfect way to describe what happened next. Because the week later, Steve and I are standing at the lockers, and he says to me, out of the blue, very nonchalant me, would you like to be best friends? It's very cute, right? 
And as if it was like a Wes Anderson movie where we all just say whatever we're thinking, I answered as if, yeah, I would like to do that. As if it was a decision like whether to go out for lunch or not, and that was it. <laughs> and like most life-changing moments, it passed rather uneventfully. And then everything began to change. Everything began to change, not because my circumstances changed. I was still in the awkward, adolescent, weird world of public high school. So my circumstances were the same, but my experience of them drastically changed because I no longer faced those circumstances alone. I faced them beside a friend. Ever since that moment at the locker, I have had this weird feeling like I am made for friendship. It would be years before I realized how exactly theologically true that statement is. But the reason we read all those scattered verses from Genesis is because I wanna show you something about the way God made us. See, think for a moment about the beginning of the world with me. We read some of those verses, but I want you to use your imagination here. Think about the beginning of creation, okay? God is making the world like an artist. He is in love, and you know that he's in love because he's making things like the northern lights, the Arctic Ocean, magnetic properties, penguins, tulips. And he keeps saying something over and over. What does he say? He says, good, 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 after everything he makes. But then, in Genesis 2, we read that God creates the pinnacle of creation, human beings, Adam, in the triune image of God, and he looks at him and he says something. Did you catch it? He says, not good. He says, it's not good that you're alone. This is like a record scratch in Genesis. All the good, 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 er, something is not good. And keep in mind, the fall has not happened yet. So something before sin was not good, and it was that Adam was alone, which, continue to use your mind here, right? That's a weird thing for God to say, because God is there. Think about that. Imagine you're, if you're on a date with somebody, and, and she's like, yeah, this is such a great dinner, except for that I'm so lonely. You'd be like, I'm, he I'm here. Like, it, God is saying, I'm here, but this is not good that Adam is alone. So it would sound blasphemous, except it's apparently good theology, because the triune God said it, according to God, you can be lonely with God. Put, put otherwise, according to God, you cannot experience God until you experience him alongside others. You can't fully experience who God is, how he made you to experience him until you experience him alongside others. This is the brilliant moment at the end of Genesis 2 that we, we also read. When Adam and Eve are together, naked and unashamed. There's, there's a ton of theology and sermons you could give about marriage here too. But part of this is just human community. They are fully known to each other, fully known to God, and yet what? There is no shame. To be fully known and fully loved, that is the life you were made for. And that is also the life that we lost. In Eden, this lasts right for about a sentence in the text because you get that beautiful verse about being fully known and fully loved and then the next part of the story, one sentence later, is the fall. But I want you to notice how this happens. Notice what happens. Eve is caught alone hearing a voice from the enemy, okay? And, and what, is, what does she say? She hears this, did God really say? Hear me on this, pay attention. So much sin begins when one, you are alone, and two, you are entertaining the question, did God really fill in the blank? D does he really care about what I do with my body? Does he really love me? Does he really care if I blank? Whatever it is, when you're alone and you're wrestling with those kind of questions, doubting God's love for you, you're in trouble. But one of the great antidotes to this is to one, run to community that reminds you that yes, God really, yes, he really does love you, yes, he really did make you, yes, he really is for you. 
That's what this is. Something amazing is happening here because we're moving against the fall and saying, no, we're not gonna be isolated, entertaining those questions. We're gonna come here together and proclaim, yes, that is the greatest love. So when you find yourself alone with the voices in your head, saying, you know, maybe porn is greater. Maybe pills are a better solution. Or maybe social media fame is greater. Maybe that relationship I know is unhealthy or maybe even abusive, but maybe it's okay. Or maybe the approval of my mom and dad, maybe good grades, maybe success, whatever it is, whatever your heart wants to fill in the blank with, I beg you, run to community. Get out of being alone. Come to a place like this, come to a friend, come to a church and say, remind me that the love of God is greater. Sin, the breakdown of sin is so relational. And you see this as you continue to read in Genesis. Look what happens right after sin enters the world. The breakdown is entirely relational, right? You get Adam and Eve hiding from each other first, covering themselves in fig leaves. Suddenly, they are ashamed to be fully known. And then in the next verse, this is Genesis 3, 8, you get humans hiding behind the bushes from God like toddlers under a bed sheet, like maybe dad doesn't see me. It's ridiculous, but it's exactly what we do. Maybe God won't actually see this. And we are ashamed to be known by others, to be known by God. The story continues. We didn't read this part, but you know this story. We go into the story of Cain, who murders his brother. And, and do you know what the, de the sentence is for the world's first murder? It's not that Cain is struck down right there. No, what is it? Like Adam and Eve, he's sent out of the garden, into isolation, into loneliness. And the words of Cain, they're, they're incredibly poignant. If you read this verse in Genesis 4.14, he says, no, I'll be a restless wanderer. I will be hidden from your face, and those that find me will kill me. See, Cain rightly understands that to be isolated from God and other people is a death sentence. Spiritually, because you're hidden from the face of God, and physically, because he realizes that alone, he won't make it. Loneliness, isolation, in other words, is the opposite of what you were made for. Biblically speaking, friendship with others and friendship with God is a matter of life and death, which totally, by the way, explains the world we live in. I wonder if you've noted this. Have you heard? There's a book out there on the table. You've seen it probably in the headlines. The Surgeon General of the United States just put out a major report this summer. We in the Western part of the world are living in what is called an epidemic of loneliness. Okay, and this might seem like medical stats to you, but they're serious. Do you know that right now Americans are dying younger? Our average lifespan is going down. This was happening before COVID, and it's not, it's, we, this hasn't happened since the 1960s. And then it was an influenza outbreak. But what's happening now is it's all younger deaths due to nasty stuff like depression, opioid abuse and overdoses, the kinds of chronic illnesses that come from isolation. Sociologists are calling this an epidemic of loneliness. I was shocked recently to learn that apparently being lonely, chronic loneliness, reduces your life expectancy to the tune of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This is, this is actually a medical condition. You could honestly say that America is becoming a case study in Genesis, proving that we were made for relationships with God and with other people. So I have four boys, as you heard in my introduction, and my wife and I like to say, Outside is best because they can't break the outdoors. So we like to get them outside. We recently learned that the beach is great because it's very hard to break the beach. So we took the four boys a couple years ago, this was I think two years ago, to the beach. And they all loved it. They love playing in the sand. They love messing with the, the waves. But my third son, Colt, he was four at the time. He loved just sitting in his life jacket in the surf and just bobbing in the water, looking at the sky. It was really cute until I realized that I'm sitting in my beach chair watching the other three build their sandcastle. I look up, and Coulter is like way down the beach. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. He's just, he's just floating happily, looking at this guy, run down, grab a drag him all the way back, put him back, sit down in my beach chair, playing in the sand. I look up. Coulter's way down the beach again. Luckily, I'm actually a decent parent, I promise. 
Luckily, my wife, who's a really good parent, bought them all bright neon green swim shirts so I can see the dots out there. So why does this keep happening? I'm about to blow your mind, right? Currents exist. <laughs> Ta-da! If you, you can say you learned something now at, at Winter Conference. Cur currents exist. Currents are the things that move us down the shoreline of life, and you don't even notice it. And you're definitely going with the current unless you fight with everything you have to swim against it. And the thing that I want to tell you is that you are a lot more like Colt than you think. You are living in a current of isolation. Like if, and I say this because if you're like me, you don't identify with this sort of out there stats on loneliness. That's somebody else. That's other people living in apartments all alone. No. No, actually, it's us. It's in the church. It's on your college campuses. It's in your heart. Because the loneliness that is plaguing the West is much more this genesis loneliness of the soul. Not the isolation of the body. You can be totally isolated in a crowded room like this. All the studies are actually talking about the kind of loneliness that you feel in a crowd. And so the, the loneliness I'm talking about might be for you that, yeah, you're allowed to, around a ton of people. You're just not known by them. Like, yeah, you show up at the meeting or at the Bible study. You come to a conference like this, but you don't speak up. You, you don't tell the truth about what's really going on inside. Did you hear Sarah E's story about she finally one time came to the conference and shared about her family experience? There's all kinds of things that it is so easy to hide because you're in the current. You're living in the current, and you don't even notice it until you're way down the beach. In fact, I would say this, the drift of American life is to become busier people who used to have friends. That's what it means to live in America. And just like Colt, you'll be drifting off down the shoreline and you don't even notice it until it's too late. And all the most dangerous currents are the ones that you don't see until you're way out to sea. And you're gone, unless, unless. There's somebody who's bigger than you and who loves you and who's watching for you that's willing to run down the shoreline of life and grab you and pull you back to safety. That person's name is Jesus. Jesus is friendship made flesh. And praise God, the story that we were made for friendship, but we were isolated by the fall, praise God it does not end in Genesis 3. It keeps going. And when you get to the John, the Gospel of John, you see this beautiful passage, but a strange passage. Because where else does Jesus describe salvation in terms of friendship? It's just here, but it's one of the most famous passages for a reason. I want you to think about this, okay? Jesus is at the last dinner he will ever have with his disciples. He's about to go die the next day. And he's telling them some of the most important things that he will ever tell them. And he tells them this. He says, I don't call you servants, for servants don't know what their master is doing. I have called you friends, because everything the Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You did not choose me, but I chose you. There's so much here. There's so much here. Rightfully one of the most famous passages in the Bible, but... I want you to see this. Jesus is saying, I am giving you back what you lost in Eden. I am not just saving you from your sins, which, by the way, is totally true, though. It's totally true that the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus saves us from our guilt and shame. Amen? That is good news. It's just not only that. Jesus never only saves us from things. He also saves us two things, and right here he's saying, I'm, I haven't just saved you from your sin and from your shame and from your isolation, I've saved you to righteousness, to love, and to community. In fact, I would describe what I'm doing for you as an act of friendship. That's an incredible statement by Jesus. Jesus is friendship made flesh. He's the archetype of a good friend here, and I want you to see two things that he is doing by being a friend to us here. He's being vulnerable and he's being committed. You see both of these things? Vulnerability, he says, I've told you everything that the Father has told to me. Like a good friend, he tells everything. 
You know, that's what a good friendship is. Like, you know everything about each other. And Jesus is saying, I am vulnerable. I will disclose myself to you. But this is even more, right? This is ultimate vulnerability. In fact, the Latin root of the word vulnerable means to be capable of being wounded. And that is perfect for this situation. Because what is Jesus about to do? He's about to lay down his life for his friends. So he is vulnerable to the point of death. He is ultimately committed. This is not a fleeting action. He says, I choose you. And, okay, zoom out with me for a minute, okay? I'm gonna be a lawyer for a second here. I really am a business lawyer. Now I'm gonna act like it. I'm gonna make my case. If paradise in the garden was to be fully known and fully loved, but in the fall, we traded being fully known for hiding and being fully loved for shame. One way to sum up the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus knows you fully and loves you anyway. He knows everything. He knows the pictures on the back of your eyelids. He knows the mental health stuff you're struggling with. He knows your childhood trauma. He knows the secrets you haven't shared. He knows what plagues you. And he says, child, I love you. I love you. None of that gets in the way of his love for you. He knows everything about you, and he has chosen you. That is good news. If you hear nothing else this week, I want you to hear that Jesus sees you fully and loves you anyway. And what, by the way, is a good friend besides somebody who's like that? Somebody who knows you through and through. They know what you look, up without, they know what you look like without your makeup on. They know your bad jokes, and they keep coming back for them. They, they know the weird things you do. They, they know what you're like late at night. They, they know your weirdness, but they love you. People who know us fully and yet love us anyway, that's what we call friendship because we sense that we were made for that kind of love. And, and I wanna elevate this concept because I think Jesus is talking about something really important here. I wanna give you a word, covenant friendship. And the reason I say that is because the word friendship has been abused in the last century, at least. It, you know, now it's something you can do on Facebook with a click, right? It's something that you can have thousands of. But covenant friendship is, is different. I wanna re-enchant this word so it sounds to you something like prayer or quiet time or church, something like you know this is essential to the Christian life because it is essential to the Christian life. Think about it. Ephesians 5.2 says be imitators of God. If, if Jesus is friendship made flesh, then looking more and more like Jesus necessarily means looking more and more like a friend. Now what would that look like? I wanna tell you. I got, I got five habits I wanna encourage you to practice as ways of bringing the friendship of the gospel to each other and to people who need to hear the gospel. First, vulnerability. So I'm, I'm talking in my living room one night with a friend, and we get a phone call. Um, we hear that one of our close friends, who was just like us, we actually had been in the crusade movement together, in fact, had become badly addicted to prescription drugs so badly that he was beginning to steal them from other people's apartments. And we heard this terrible news about our old friend and we hung up the phone that night and I'm sitting in the room with my friend after we hear this and surprisingly the question on our minds was not how did this happen? Because unfortunately, I think I was 27 at the time of this story, by then I had already gotten it. People fall in private long before they fall in public. I was, I was already ready, I'd seen enough Oh yeah, people fail, people, because people hide things. And the question in the room that night wasn't, oh my gosh, how did this happen? The question in the room that night with me and my friend was, is there anything you're not telling me? Are you hiding anything? It was a heavy question. And I wanna talk to you <laughs> for a minute about that. I, students, campus leader, staff, whatever, whatever you are, every single one of us in this room has the ability to hide behind the fig leaves of life. It is so easy, you do not even have to try. And I don't know what it is for you, it might be the fake usernames, it might be burner accounts, it might be hidden text chains, it might be hiding the fig leaves of the trauma you haven't shared, secrets you haven't told, 
guilt or jealousy that you're afraid to speak out, but whatever it is, one of the most true and the most sad features of human life is that it's just so easy to hide from each other. And it will burn you up. As the psalmist says, Psalm 32, 3, when I remained silent, when I did not confess, my bones burned within me. See, confession is an ancient practice of the church for a reason. It is the antidote to the fig leaves. It is to say, no, here is, I'm gonna state the truth, I'm gonna confess the truth about who God is and about who I am. Standing in the room that night with my friend, we asked each other that question. We said, okay, is there anything you're not telling me? It, it was an amazing moment, because both of us looked at each other and said, no, you, you actually know everything. And what I wanna ask you tonight is, do you have somebody in your life like that? Now, look, caveat. If you go around just telling anybody anything at any time, that is the sign of relational unhealth, not health, okay? Let's just be clear. It's not what I'm talking about. But Jesus had a few people to whom he made everything known. Do you? If you don't, or if it's been a while, I wanna tell you, this conference is for you. This conference is for you. This whole ministry exists to get people to be known by Jesus and to know him. It is a beautiful thing. This whole ministry is designed to create spaces where you can actually take the mask off and be honest about yourself before Jesus because guess what? That's how you experience grace. Grace is not grace until it's grace for your actual sinful life. God doesn't for, forgive our pretend selves, the, the people that we curate and pretend that we are online. No, he forgives our actual selves. That's the good news of the gospel. And that's what this conference is for. I would beg you, don't leave it hiding. Don't waste this opportunity in ministries like this and go unknown. The stakes are high, y'all. I started with that life and death story for a reason. I'll give you another example. I was in this ministry of crew years ago in college and there was a guy in it who just, he deeply affected, praise God, deeply affected my walk with the Lord. Such an incredible influence in my life. It would be almost 15 years later that I would learn that he would leave his wife and his four children for a secret that he was hiding then and for the next 15 years. Something that happened in his teen years that he just never was willing to share. His bones burned up. It's so easy to hide. And I know you're hearing this, and it could just sound scary, right? Like, okay, but it, it's, if I tell the truth about myself, well then I'll be able to be wounded, right? Vulnerability means to be capable of being wounded. And I wanna say, yeah, yeah, you need people that know you so well, they could wound you, but like Jesus, they stick around and love you anyway. That's the second part of this. The second habit I wanna give you is commitment because you can't do vulnerability unless you do commitment. Um, a couple of years ago, I was talking with a friend on my front porch, it was a new friend, we didn't know each other that well, and we, we, we were having this kind of conversation that was, that was really good, and we are having these C.S. Lewis U2 moments again, realizing we are passionate about the same things, and my friend turned to me and was like, you know, we should lean into this, we should, we should do this more often, we should meet regularly. It was so simple, it was so nonchalant. It was much less awkward than the, do you wanna be best friends at the lockers? But it was equally as powerful because, yo, words change reality. Just naming the truth, naming a relationship has incredible power. Think about, God made the world through words. And then he passed on to humans through Adam the divine gift of naming the world. When you name something, it has incredible power to bring out new realities. And naming a relationship and saying, I'm here, I'm in this, we should lean into this, is incredibly powerful. It would be just a couple, uh, I think months later after that conversation, that Barrett and I grew so close that he asked me to be a groomsman at his wedding, which I was honored to say yes to. We got to the wedding, and at the ceremony, right before the vows, he gave each of us groomsmen a ceremonial bottle of scotch. And I was like, oh cool, well, I love it. What is this weird number written on top? On top of the bottle, was this like big black Sharpie marker number, 2035, everybody had a different number, and I was like, Barrett, what is this? 
code, he's like, oh, that's the year we're gonna open it and paste this together. You have to keep it closed till then, 2035. <laughs> I was like, I was honored and taken aback all at once, honored because my friend Barrett assumed that in 20 years, we would still be hanging out. I was also taken aback because he never asked me if I wanted to do that. <laughs> I, I mean, it was a bit scary and a bit beautiful at the same time, and that's exactly what covenant friendship is like, because it's exactly what the covenant friendship of Christ is like. It is beautiful and it is scary. And what I wanna suggest to you, my best advice is just to commit by naming relationships. Like, th th whatever it is in your life right now, your small group, your men's group, your women's group, your accountability group, your, your, your group of people, I wanna offer you the word covenant friend and invite you to invite others into that kind of relationship, which is, I'm, it's not necessarily a lifelong commitment, okay? We're not talking about marriage, don't worry. No vows, no contracts signed in blood. Though you could, and if you do, come tell me, I'd be interested. <laughs> but th this is just a way to name that you are committed to being fully known in relationship so that you can be fully loved. And think about that. Those things have to go together. You, to be fully known without being loved is to be exposed, right? That's what we do to celebrities, and it's awful. We know everything about them, but we don't care about them. It's, it's awful. But to be fully loved without being truly and fully known, that's to be hidden. That's the way you might feel around your, your family or a group of friends where you know that they don't actually know you. But when you're fully known and fully loved, vulnerability with the commitment, you're doing something incredible because you're imitating Jesus. That's exactly what he did for you. And in these two habits I'm suggesting, what if we turn and give it to each other? Number three, the habit of time. Maybe it's because I'm a business lawyer with four boys who also does writing and speaking on the side. But the, the biggest objection that I hear in life and that I feel is that I'm just too busy for meaningful relationship. I'm too busy for that kind of relationship. In fact, even when I was at University of Virginia, I remember we would say this all the time, like, oh, I'm so busy. And I look at myself then, I'm, I'm like cracking up. I'm like, seriously, you were busy? Like you slept until two on Saturday, p.m. <laughs> No shame. You may or may not think you're busy. All I'm just saying is time is actually the great equalizer. You know why? Because we all have the same hours in a day. The question is just, how do we use them? And so this is truly just a question of habit. It, it's just this idea that, yeah, it's common sense that we all need deep relationships, but it's not common practice. Everybody knows it, hardly anybody does it. That's why it's the drift of American life. We become busier people who used to have friends. So all I'm saying is fight back with a schedule, with this, this redeeming, sanctifying idea of a habit that you do over and over. Here, here's what I would suggest. Spend at least one hour in intentional friendship every week, all right? And th there's so much grace to this. Think about anything else that is essential to your physical survival and your emotional thriving, you don't have to do a ton of. I mean, I hope you sleep at least like seven hours a night, maybe more. Like you're gonna find out after college, you have to work and parent a lot more, unfortunately, than you sleep. You have to eat constantly to stay alive. You need to carry a gallon jug of water and drink constantly if you wanna be well hydrated. I mean, and in your spiritual life, you should be doing disciplines like praying without ceasing or some morning rhythm of, of prayer and meditation or something, even in my life as a busy lawyer now, I have a rhythm of scripture before phone. I just won't open my phone until I read scripture. These are things you do all the time, every day, because they're important to physical survival and spiritual thriving. But friendship, remarkably, remarkably disproportionate impact. One hour a week of honestly talking to friends will totally change the rest of your life. What, what is it for you? If you're not going to the campus meeting, start going. If you are, maybe start going to the Bible study. If you're going to a Bible study, maybe carve out one hour a week to sit down with that one kind of covenant friend and really dig deep into your life. What, whatever that hour is, I'm saying your life will be changed by diving into that one hour a week. I, the way that I do this now is uh, I, I show up every other Tuesday to my front porch. <laughs> 
or my friend Steve or Matt's front porch. This is, yes, the Steve from high school, we're still trucking. And we have this bi-weekly rhythm of just hanging out, sitting on our front porch and talking, which sounds as normal as it is. We're, we're just talking about our marriages, about our kids, about our jobs, about sports, sharing a drink. But we also do this crazy radical thing where we really tell the truth about our lives. The mental health struggles that exist, we talk about them. Our internet history, we talk about it. Our paychecks, what's happened in our kids' lives, what's happening in our marriages, nothing is off the table. And just through this regular little habit of showing up, I, I'm serious, I, I'm feeling a word from the Holy Spirit. Christ wants to use the habit of showing up in your life to sanctify you. There are so many opportunities he's giving you in a ministry like this, and he's just saying, just show up. Just come show up and speak up. And let me tell you, from just showing up on the front porch with Steve and Matt for years now, I am standing in front of a crowd of, I don't know, a thousand people, which should be intimidating, but I'm standing here as a person without secrets. I cannot tell you how safe that feels because I've felt the opposite before. I've been scared in a room of nobody. I've been scared in a room of 10 because I know I'm carrying secrets. It is so incredibly peaceful to know that you are known by other people. Why is that? Because you were made for that greatest love. You were made for that greatest love of being known by Jesus. Bonhoeffer writes in his incredible book, Life Together, which you should read, that the word of Christ is truer in the mouth of my brothers and sisters. I love that, and I feel that. Because when I confess and I do my sin to the Lord, yeah, yeah I feel like I'm saying it out loud, but when I confess it to my brothers and sisters, <laughs> when I tell it to Lauren, my wife, and Steve and Matt, my two best friends, and they look at me and say, I hear you, I get it, you're messed up, but I love you anyway, and Jesus loves you anyway. The Bible comes alive. I'm like, oh my gosh, really? You guys actually know me and really love you? It is incredible. And in a simple power of keeping to a schedule, your whole life can be changed. It doesn't take a lot of time. And that's grace. Think about it. Jesus uses your clumsy, half-broken efforts and does incredible things with them. If that isn't the definition of grace, grace, I don't know what is. Fourth habit, this one's gonna be short, technology. Because you cannot talk about relationships without talking about technology, all right? And, and over the past decade, there have been so many new forms of technologies that are changing how we relate to each other. FaceTimes, text change, Zooms, social medias, all the things. You know them, you use them, I do too. And let me tell you, I love my text chains with my friends. There are an ungodly amount of just gifs and jokes and political commentaries and spiritual debates and pictures of kids and updates. I, like, I love it, okay? I love it, but I don't live on it. What I wanna tell you is that technological connections are snacks. Embodied relationships are meals. And you know the difference. Think about it. Snacks, when you eat a snack, you have the feeling of being full, but your body goes unnourished. And you know what will happen if you live like that, right? You'll wither away and die, okay? What I wanna tell you is that you are like that relationally too. If you live on a diet of technological connections, your soul will wither because you were meant for embodied relationship with other people. Hebrews 10 says, do not give up the habit of meeting together. You are meant for embodied interactions, for hugs, for crying together, for seeing each other in person, for watching facial expressions while you talk. These are things, technology is great for keeping up, all right? I love it. I love the pictures of kids. I love the jokes, I love the gifs. I also love Oreos and guacamole, but I don't live on them, right? They're great snacks to bridge to another meal or they're great accents to a meal, but you feast on nourishment. You feast on embodied relationship. Number five, evangelism. Um, I wanna go back to the story I started with, with Steve and I in high school. So as we grew in our relationship and moved from shared activities of hacky sacks and skateboards and drum sets to a shared life of vulnerability, we, we started to grow in our faith as we grew in our friendship. It was a beautiful thing. And along the way, we met this other guy who clearly wanted to be our friend too. He started showing up to all the places we were, following us, dressing a little bit like us. 
And Steve and I like this guy pretty well, but we thought that to keep our friendship deep, we had to keep it close. And we did one of the most awful things you can do to anybody. We let this guy in just enough to know us and to know that we weren't letting him in all the way. It was horrible. It was awful. I, I say it's awful because there is no greater inversion of the gospel than to shut people out of relationship. Think about this. The gospel means that the Trinity, the triune God, at great personal cost because of the death of Jesus, opened up relationship to you, inviting you to be united with Christ and enter into the fellowship of the Trinity. The, the gospel is not exclusive. It is cosmically inclusive. So is covenant friendship. Covenant friendship embraces the world because we know the love of God can never run out. So we can always give more too. And I'm happy to say that in a version of this story that's gonna be way too condensed because frankly the details are very private. I'm not gonna tell all my friends secrets. Matt, this guy who was on the outside, came to know us just enough to know how broken we are and just to know how good the God we worship were and we repented and we let Matt in, and Matt is the Matt who me and Steve with meet every other week. We have been friends now for over two decades. And Matt actually came to know Jesus through that broken experience of relationship. If that's not grace, I don't know what is. God can actually use your brokenness, your sins, your mistakes to bring people in. And Matt is a continual reminder to me that the fire of friendship is contagious. People want to be around relationships like that. I actually named my son Asher, Asher, Stephen, Matthew early because Asher means the happiness of God and Stephen and Matt are my two covenant friends. And Asher is a continual reminder to me that the happiness of God is found in a life of covenant friendship with God and with others. And I want you to think about evangelism right now. It's so hard, isn't it, to talk to other students about love, about God, about justice, about dignity, about human life. I mean, we all have different definitions of these words. But Madeline Lingle once put it like this. We draw people to Christ not simply by discrediting loudly what they believe, but by showing them a light so lovely that they long with all their hearts to know the source of it. And I want to suggest to you that in a dark age of loneliness like we're living in, one of the greatest companions to evangelism might be to light up the night with the fire of friendship. Imagine if your campus movements, if your Bible studies were filled with these vibrant fires of friendship where all the lonely and all the people on the outside were like, I wanna pull up to that fire, I wanna be there. And they could come and see that that light, that warmth is the light of Christ, is the warmth of his love. We didn't make it, we're just showing it off because it's that beautiful. Wouldn't that be something? I can't get down from the stage without just telling you real quick what happened in that hotel in Mali. Praise God that when the hotel door opened, it opened not to a terrorist, but to a Frenchman, a member of the UN special ops teams. He was carrying an assault rifle. He reached out for my friend's hand. He grabbed it and said, we're running out of here. Do not let go. And guns raised, they ran out and praise God, left the building. It was a couple days before my friend was able to get a flight home but y'all, we threw the biggest party when he got back. <laughs> All my friends came over to my house and we stayed up late into the night, praying, singing, laughing, crying, talking, and praising God because our friend had been snatched from the jaws of death and was home safe and well. Amen? And I'm so glad you clapped for that because it is an incredible thing when a life is saved. And I felt a vision of revelation that night, that all of us friends were together praying and singing in the presence of each other and God because we had been snatched from the jaws of death. We were saved. And isn't that the way the Bible ends? We were made for people. We were made for friendship with God and others. We fell, but Jesus is covenant friendship and we are destined to go to relationship with him and others. Rela Revelation is this big party where we are together with each other, no fig leaves, no hiding, no shame. With God, with Jesus, it, Revelation says that he will be our God and we will be his people. 
And I, I, I sat in the room with my friends that night thinking, this is the destiny we were made for. Friendship with God and others is our final destiny. My friend told me a story that night when we were sitting together about other people who had escaped the hotel. One was an American. A story similar to his, a Marine had finally come to her door and same thing, assault rifle raised. She said, the Marine said, grab my hand, don't let go. And the American ran out the building with him, but she looked down and she saw on the Marine's forearm in black marker were the numbers of rooms written of the Americans in the building. And they were just getting crossed off. And she looked down and she saw her number that was next, about to be crossed off. I will ever hold that image in my mind as an image of covenant friendship, that we know each other's names, we know where each other are, and we will come for each other. Isaiah 49 tells us there's another man with our names written on his hands. And he is stronger than any Marine. In fact, there is no evil, there's not even death that can hold him back. That man's name is Jesus. He is the one who reached through the current of loneliness, who reached through the jaws of death to grab you and to pull you to life, amen. He has your name written on his hand. So I tell you, I beg you, I plead with you, I offer you tonight, receive the covenant friendship of that Jesus and then go and extend it to the world. Light up the night. It's a matter of life and death. Let me pray for you. Lord, we come before you tonight and we honor you. We look up, we praise you. I think of the way that everybody was down here jumping and singing and laughing and dancing earlier because it's worth it. We rejoice because you have reached through the jaws of death to grab us and you have not just saved us from our sin, you have made us friends. Lord, would you, would you, to the people, there are people here who do not realize it tonight, who don't know it or who have forgotten it. Lord, would you bring to their hearts the clarity, the beauty of the message that you love us despite our sin and shame that you know us fully and you love us anyway. And Lord, would you turn our lives inside out so that we might go and love others like that. It's in your name we ask this, amen.